Let's take our Bibles this morning and turn to Matthew chapter 6, Matthew the 6th chapter. We're proud of all of our graduates and we wish them the very best in God's plan for their life. And today we're doing two things at one time. We're ending our series on the Lord's Prayer by looking at the last half of the last verse in this prayer, but at the same time this is a a message to our graduates in particular and all of us in general because in the last part of this prayer, Jesus actually gives us three keys to a great life. And so if you're graduating and just beginning to run life's race or you find yourself in the middle of your career and you are thinking about whether or not you should persevere or or change gears, or maybe you're nearing the end of your career. In this passage of Scripture today, we're going to put the focus on what Jesus said about a great life, because a great life is more than just making a living. And I don't know anywhere in the Word of God that it's more clear Uh, than how to make a great life than hearing what Jesus has to say for us this morning and and to us. So look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 13, as we stand together. And we're going to look at the latter part of the verse. Jesus said, For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Now I want you to look at that. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. In in those few words are three keys to a great life. And then Jesus said, and we said with him, Amen. Thank you. Be seated. I was reading something on the internet the other day about an old farmer who was giving some advice about how to be successful in life. And when I saw that, I thought this would be something good to share with our graduates and something good for all of us, I believe. And so here's what he had to say, this old farmer who was filled with a lot of wisdom through the years, and he gave some advice. He said, your fences need to be horse high, pig tight, and bull strong. He said, keep skunks and bankers at a distance. Life is simpler, he said, when you plow around the stumps. How true that is. A bumblebee is considerably faster than a John Deere tractor. He said, words that soak into your ears are whispered, not yelled. And how true that is. He also said, forgive your enemies, it messes up their head. (laughs) And he went on to say these things. He said, you cannot unsay a cruel word. Every path has a few puddles. When you wallow with pigs, expect to get dirty. Live a good, honorable life. Then when you get older and think back, you'll enjoy it a second time. And here's a good one. He said, if you find yourself in a hole, the first thing to do is stop digging. (laughs) Sometimes you get, he said, and sometimes you get got. The biggest troublemaker you'll probably ever have to deal with watches you from the mirror every morning. And then he said, good judgment comes from experience, and a lot of that comes from bad judgment. And how true that is. He also said, if you get to thinking you're a person of some influence, then just try ordering somebody else's dog around. 
And then he said, live simply, love generously, care deeply, speak kindly, leave the rest to God. That's pretty good advice to live by. Amen? If we were to travel to Jerusalem just outside the old city, up on the Mount of Olives, we would see a little church. Tradition says that church was built on the very place where Jesus taught His disciples this model prayer that we call the Lord's Prayer. If we were to go inside that small church today, we would find the Lord's Prayer written in nearly every language on the tiles around the walls. People come from all around the world to visit that little church and they find their language on one of those tiles and they stand there and respectfully and reverently recite the words to the Lord's Prayer. Now I want you to think about this prayer for a moment as we finish this series today. Here is a prayer that is more than 2,000 years old. It is a prayer that can be prayed in less than one minute yet it contains the foundation for living, the framework for living. And in this 13th verse, there are three keys to a great life. If you will, look at that verse again, the latter part of it, and circle three words. The words kingdom, the word power, and the word glory. Kingdom, power, and glory. In those three words, Jesus unlocks for us three keys to a great life. Look at what he has to say. First, in this prayer, he tells us that we are to pray, Thine is the kingdom, or yours is the kingdom. Now notice that word kingdom and think about it. What is a kingdom? A kingdom is the territory subject to the ruler or the rule of a king. So the kingdom of God is the place where Christ rules. And where does Jesus rule? Well, in Luke 17, 21, Jesus said, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. Jesus was trying to help them understand that where the king is, there is where the kingdom is. Then where is King Jesus today? Well, you say he's in heaven. And yes, he is. So the kingdom of God is in heaven. But if you have been born again, Jesus is in your heart. And if He lives in your heart, then the kingdom of God is within you. And Jesus taught us to pray in this verse that God's kingdom would come. And when we pray for the kingdom of God to come, we're praying for unsaved people to be saved. And we're also praying for the return of Jesus. None of us know when Jesus is coming again, but all of us know that He is. And we're to be ready. And wouldn't it be marvelous if He just decided to come on back today? And so we're taught here to pray. And this is one of the keys to life because Jesus is teaching us here, seek God's kingdom. Seek God's kingdom if you want to be successful in your life, if you want to bring Jesus glory in your life in fact turn with me for a moment to the 33rd verse of that sixth chapter and look at what Jesus said chapter 6 verse 33 but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you Jesus is teaching us that the priority of our life should be to put the kingdom of God first in our life. But what does that mean? How are we to put God's kingdom first in our life? It simply means that God's plan for my life becomes my plan for my life. That God's plan for your life becomes your plan for your life. It means that God's agenda becomes our agenda. It means that we care about the things that God cares about. A large part of the sermon that Jesus preached in Matthew that we know as the Sermon on the Mount is about worry and about being anxious. And Jesus talked about all the things we worry about and all the things that make us anxious, like our future or our health or our material needs or our happiness. And he said if we put him first, 
that we really don't need to worry about any of those things because He will bless us and He will take care of us if we put Him first. And that's what He meant here when He said, but seek first the kingdom of God, His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Jesus is teaching us to put Him first. And that's what we do when we seek God's kingdom. We put Him first in our lives. So I want to ask you a question. Answer this in your heart. Is Jesus Christ really first in your life? Right now, today, in every area of your life, can you say, just you and the Lord, can you say to Him, Lord, you know I have put you first place in my life. Whatever we want God to bless, Jesus is teaching us that we must give Him first place in that. For example, if we want God to bless our marriage, then we have to put Jesus first in our marriage. Our spouse should be number two in our life because Jesus is number one. Can you say amen? If we want God to bless our career, then we put Jesus first and our career is to fall down the line. But Jesus has to be first. It's the same way with our finances. If we want God to bless us financially, we must put Christ first in that. And the same is true with our time. God wants us to put Him first. But how do we do that? How do we put God first with our time? Two things. Give God the first part of every day and give God the first day of every week. Now, I want to say that again. Give God the first part of every day. Do you do that? And then give God the first day of every week. That's how we put Him first. And that's so important as we, especially for our graduates, as you begin to live life's race and things are going to get really busy for you. You're going to finish your education. Most of you will marry and raise a family and have a career, and things are going to get extremely busy for you. And the easy thing to do is to put Jesus somewhere to the side. But I want you to know He can't bless that, and He won't bless that. The kingdom of God must be first. Seek you first the kingdom of God. Why? Because that's where the king is. You put the king first, and he promises to bless us, and all these things come after King Jesus. So if you understand what Jesus is teaching here about seeking God's kingdom, say amen. amen. And then here's something else. The second key to living a, a great life Look at verse 13 again. He says, For thine is the kingdom and the what? The power. Look at that word power. It comes from the word dunamis, from which our word dynamite comes from. It is sometimes used to refer to a miracle. So Jesus is saying one of the keys to life is depending upon God's power. We have to learn to depend upon God's power. And this emphasizes the supernatural power of God because, ladies and gentlemen, God can do things that we can't do. And God will do things. And we've all seen God do those things. I mean, if you're saved this morning, you've seen God work a miracle in your heart. Now, somebody ought to say amen. It's a miracle. The miracle of salvation in, in our life. And there are some people that believe they don't need God's help. Have you ever met anybody like that? They think they're self-sufficient. They have the idea that they can do everything on their own. But Psalm 84, 5 says, Blessed is the man whose strength is in you. Blessed is the person whose strength is in the Lord. You see, God blesses us when we realize that we must depend upon Him for His power. Now, how do you do that? How do you depend upon God? Well, it requires faith. You have to have faith. And the Bible says over and over again that faith pleases God. Our faith positions us to receive the blessings of God. That's the reason God sometimes allows us to go through situations in life where we have to depend upon Him. 
Have you ever been in one of those situations? If you have, raise your hand. That's probably 100% of us. The Bible tells a story in Exodus about Moses leading the people of Egypt toward the promised land. And you imagine what that must have been like for them. At one point, there they stood before the Red Sea and all that water in front of them, and the Egyptian army was coming up fast behind them. And they thought they were going to die. I mean, where could they go? What could they do? And so the people began to panic. And they said to Moses, was it because there was no graves in Egypt that you brought us out here in the desert to die? And you remember what Moses said? He said, don't be afraid. Just stand here and see what God will do. You see, he just depended upon God's power. And if we could just get a hold of that and begin to live our life that way, where we didn't panic, we just lived depending on the power of God. And you know the end of that story. You know what happened. Now, Moses told them to stand still and and watch God. And they would depend on his power. And they walked across on dry ground, didn't they? Do you believe that? That's what the Bible says. I believe that. They walked across on dry ground because they depended upon God's power. Listen, if we wait until we feel confident enough to take a first step, we probably never will. Because I can tell you this, I would imagine that all of those people that day standing before the Red Sea were not too too enthusiastic about taking that first step into the water. But they had to take the step before God parted the water. And we have to do the same because that's where faith comes in. God would do so much more in our lives if we would just learn to take that first step of faith. Because that step of faith enables God to do what He wants to do to start with. So we depend upon God's power by taking a step of faith. And that's especially true when we feel discouraged and we want to quit. And I want to say to the graduates this morning, there will come those days when you're going to want to throw up your hands and quit. There will come those days when you will be very discouraged. But those are the times that God will give you His power to make it when you want to quit. How many can testify to that in your own life? Would you say amen? You see, we depend upon God's power. That's why Paul wrote to the Philippians, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It is the power of Jesus Christ. It's not our power. It's the power of Christ in us. As we depend upon God's power, God will transform us to do things that we thought we were incapable of doing. And for some of you today, your first step of faith will be to begin a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Coming to Him to say you are sorry for your sin and stepping out in faith to receive Him as your Savior. And all of us want to be able to say when we get to the end of our life, I've lived a really great life. It's it's been, I say it like this, it's been a really good ride. And you look back and you see, and that's what God does. That's what God can do. So depend on God's power. And then here's the third thing Jesus says. Look back at verse 13, and we're almost finished. And that third word is glory. The word glory means to hold in honor or to be ascribed fame. And Jesus is teaching us that we are to live for God's glory. We must live for His glory. We, God put us on this earth to live for His glory, to give honor to Him, to make Him known to others. That is our purpose. We are to know Him and make Him known. We are to live for His glory. This week, I was in a meeting where a man shared his testimony with a small group of men. And in that meeting, he said that he grew up in a broken home. His daddy died when he was a a young child, and his mother really didn't care about the children. She went down a wrong road and got heavily involved in drugs and things that 
none of us would hope that our mother would be involved in. And then he said because of the way he was raised at a young age, he started drinking, he started taking drugs, he started running with the wrong crowd, and he just went down to the bottom. And he said then one day he heard about Jesus. And when he heard about Jesus, he made up his mind from that day on he was going to live for the glory of God. And he gave his life to Christ. And he said, Jesus forgave me and, and Jesus saved me. And this morning he is being ordained as a pastor of a church. Because there is no glory like the glory of God. You see, that's the key to a great life. So, so graduates, please, if I could say just one thing to you this morning, it would be this. Please, do more than just make a living. Make a life. Make a life that counts. And you're a very talented group of, of young people. And you can help a lot of people in your life. But let me say something else. We don't need to be simply super talented to give glory to God because God is not so much looking for our ability as He is looking for our availability. God just wants us to be available to Him. And when we make ourselves available to God, He will provide opportunities for us to glorify Him. So to our graduates, as you leave your high school days and your college days behind you, you're going out into a world that will not always be very nice, nor will it be very comfortable. But you will do well if you remember these three keys to a great life. Seek God's kingdom, depend upon God's power, and live for God's glory. Do that, and God will bless your life for the rest of your life. And all of God's people said, Amen. Now we're going to stand together here and in the Christian Life Center if you'll stand with me. And we come to the time in our service when we extend an invitation for anyone who would like to receive Jesus as Savior to do that. And today, if you do not know the Lord, this is your moment with Him. You say, well, I came today to see a graduate. Well, that's fine and good and wonderful and we're glad you did, but Sir or ma'am, if, if you don't know Jesus, God brought you here for another reason. God brought you here so you could know Jesus today, so you could have your sin forgiven, and so you could have eternal life in heaven. And that will happen to you if you'll just turn from your sin and turn to Jesus and receive Him by faith. And so we invite anyone in this service and anyone listening right now to Christian Life Center to just give your life to Jesus and come and share that with one of the pastors as we sing this song. There may be those here today and you'd just like to come and pray for one of these graduates at the altar. And that's, that's the best thing you can do is just pray for them. And there may be those who would like to come and recommit their lives to Jesus or to join this church. So as the Holy Spirit leads you today, you come. As we sing, you come this morning in obedience to Him. Thank you.